Hello, and welcome to episode 161 of Prose. This week, desperately seek connection and eat some energy of another. While you listen, please consider heading to prosedpodcast.com, our one-stop shop for all things prose. There you can find links to social media, the episodes, a shop for swag, the show's Patreon, and much more. On social media, like and share away. Most importantly, please do consider subscribing, rating, or reviewing wherever you grab your podcasts. Thanks for listening. Let's get to the tales, shall we? This week we have The Sea Train and Just Another. Enjoy. The Sea Train, an original short story by Jared I. McGee. Public transportation gets a bad rap. That's a given in almost every city in the world that actually has public transportation. Where I grew up, the only public transportation we needed was our own two legs. That tired little joke wasn't exactly true even when I was a youngling. Now that I am older, I recognize it for what it was. Humor masking a town and a people that were under the boot of socioeconomic depression, repression, oppression. I've come a long way since thinking that public transportation was some sort of awful handout that took away from one's life experience. I miss my home. I miss my family. I do not miss my life being dependent on how quickly I could jog somewhere and still look somewhat respectable for an interview, or a shift, or an audition. Since my younger days, I've moved on into larger cities, going from place to place, from job to job, only ever worried about money and how I could live a semi-comfortable life while still being able to send some money back home to my family to help them eat and generally struggle a bit less. After pinging around the U.S. for the better part of two decades, it was only proper that I would eventually end up on the East Coast, and then in the city of all cities, New York City. The coasts have an inertia to them, and it's rather difficult to avoid ending up on one or the other. L.A. had me for some time. L.A.'s public transportation was atrocious, almost non-existent. I once read an article by Matt Novak of the Smithsonian called Nobody Walks in L.A., The Rise of Cars and the Monorails That Never Were. It was one of many pieces I read explaining to me why the public transportation in Southern California wasn't any better than it was. Even out so far away in L.A., though, New York's pool was too great, and I eventually landed a job that, at least on the surface, looked like it would provide me with a few creature comforts while allowing me to send even more money back home to the family. So, New York it was. My entire life, I've known that I wasn't social per se. Yet, I also know that I need to be around people. I need to have some form of affection and intimacy in my life with other humans. Touch in particular being of great import. Need. Not want. Need. When I don't have that touch quota, I find myself getting sickly, tired more easily, and more quickly, short of temper, short of breath. Put simply, without physical touch, I begin to waste away. It wasn't until I spent my first three inconsecutive years in St. Louis before I realized that this odd observation might be something important, something I should pay a bit more attention to. There as I worked and worked and worked to ensure my family a better life, I also had the opportunity to mill around in larger venues for music or alcohol or dancing. It didn't matter. All that mattered were the people that would bump into me as they scooched closer to the stage, maneuvered toward the bar for another drink, or ground and shimmied to whatever the DJ was playing at the time. 
Those brief moments of human contact set fireworks off in my brain. It was like drinking a pot of coffee and taking one of those yellow jacket pills my trucker uncles used to take with each little brush of skin on skin. It must have been obvious in just how nice this was for me, as a little old woman once approached me at a crowded farmer's market, taking me to the side and telling me that she, quote, knew what I was. This mysterious and somewhat ominous entry into discussion quickly changed pace when I agreed to walk and talk with her. Her name was Iona, and she said that vampires were real. I of course scoffed. She said that vampires were more subtle and varied as a species than only needing blood. She told me about psionic vampires and sanguineal vampires and, most importantly to me, she told me about pathetic vampires. Pathetic as in from the Greek. She told me of emotional vampires. Apparently, pathetic vampires gained energy from a variety of things. For example, the equally loathed and lusted after succubi and incubi derived their strength largely from sexuality and engaging in various carnal activities. Dolorous pathetic vampires leached in energy and power from sadness frequenting funerals and grave sites and hospitals. Thymotic pathetic vampires craved anger. Phobotic pathetic vampires hungered for fear. Iona didn't know which one I was exactly, but she knew that I needed some sort of emotional response based on physical touch. She could apparently all but see and smell it on me as I bumbled about the farmer's market feigning clumsiness in hopes of human contact. Iona brought up a very good point. She wanted to know why I didn't just seek out a relationship in order to get that physical affection that kept me so sharp, so stealthy, so healthy, and so charged. To that, I had no good answer. It wasn't like I didn't try to get and keep significant others, but I guess I just wasn't very good at either part of that equation, the getting or the keeping. Certainly I'd noticed, I told her, that when in loving relationships I was damn near unstoppable. A god among mortals, really. With her pointing this out to me, the relationship between how I was acting and interacting with the world when I was saturated in affection versus when I was not became all the more clear. For the better part of a month, after this wonderful windfall in a farmer's market, I'd see Iona twice a week, there at that same market. We'd chat and walk, and she'd further convince me of the truth of her words. That was seven years ago now. I've had no more luck in love than your average schmuck, I fear. So that crackle of energy I got from physical touch is all too rare. I've also been constantly questioning that ridiculous notion that Iona planted in my head back in St. Louis. Sure, I enjoy physical touch and I feel less than myself without it, but I don't know if I can fully leap into the fantastical idea that vampires are real, much less that I myself am some form of pathetic vampire. It all seems so strange and so beyond the pale now that I don't have Iona sitting next to me, strolling next to me, holding my hand, talking, encouraging me to think in that direction. Those thoughts return to me rather often now that I am in New York City, though. My job here is all but all-consuming, so I don't have time to really take a good crack at forming any relationship that would help me further prove or disprove Iona's hypothesis. I do get flashes of that energy, or at least what I have convinced myself are injections of energy, when I ride the bus. But buses are a bit less crowded, a bit less frequented than the subways. Now there is some public transportation at its best. To a worldly guy that began his life without access to such options, the subway system is all but magical. Zipping across the five boroughs is a neat little game to the uninitiated, and just as powerful. I'm often squished up against strangers, sitting up, standing. That side-to-side -side contact makes me think back to Iona's insistence of what I was 
and why I was so very drawn to contact with others. I ride the sea train more than most, simply because it's nearby. But it also does me the service of servicing a rather diverse set of people, meaning that I get all sorts of different people sitting close to me during those rush hours that I have now come to crave. The best ride I've had recently was with a friend of a friend. It was on the C-Train because, again, it services my little niche of the world far better than most of the other subway options. We were returning to Manhattan for some reason that escapes me. The train was empty, as it was later in the evening and long past the droves of people trying to get from here to there and there to here. I wrote that trip off as one where I wouldn't get that perceived jolt from all the beings canned up together. But, to my surprise, my friend of a friend leaned up against me, propping her head on my shoulder, tired from a long day. The long day seemed to have her ready to nap, and the hour to her stop seemed to be enough for her to decide to lie back and get comfortable for a quick cat nap. This purposeful physical contact was like when I put my tongue to batteries on dares as a child. It was like what I'd always read cocaine users describing a bump was like. It was like the best, most pure day I've ever had. It was overwhelming. Her arms encircled my left arm. The crown of her head snuggled its way into the nape of my neck. Her legs bare from the skirt she was wearing touched my legs bare from the shorts I was wearing. All that contact was beyond me. My breath caught. I thought my heart might explode. In that moment, I couldn't help but allow my pendulum swing of rationalizing things go sharply back the other way. Maybe Iona was right. This went far beyond simple thirst for affection after a major lack thereof, surely. This was something, something else. For that roughly 50 minutes, I let the friend of a friend sleep, while I tried to even out both my breathing and the thrumming of my heart. I'm sure she could feel the quickening of my pulse, and I'm betting she wrote the whole thing off as a crush or just an awkwardness around women and or affection. That was fine. That, at least, would make something resembling sense. That was something realistic, and not torn from a bad fantasy novel. Still. I ride the C train a lot these days. That's not my train to work, but it's the train that services my little niche area the best. So there's that. I've learned when the various rush hours are, and I find myself losing lunch breaks and turning down social plans to get on and ride at those times. Maybe Iona really was right. Maybe I am something out of a comic book or a horror flick or a graphic novel or a poorly pitched screenplay. I certainly fit the bill in how I respond to physical touch. Then again, maybe I am something far more common. Maybe I am just another affection-starved wraith in an increasingly disconnected world. Nothing special, nothing supernatural, just lonely. Thank you for listening to Sea Train, an original short story by Jared I. McGee. All sounds you hear come from YouTube's free audio library and freesound.org. Everything that's being used is being used under CC0 1.0 Universal Public Domain Dedication Licenses. I certainly hope you'll stick around for our next short story this week. A short story all about getting one's energy from another in a different sort of way.
Just Another, an original short story by Jared I. McGee. Her head was on my pillow again. She swore that fat, fluffy pillows were her preference, yet this was becoming a habit of hers, her stealing my thin wisp of a head cushion. Ah, the truth was that I don't like pillows and often chose to sleep without one altogether. I found that pillows cause the neck to crane and contort in all sorts of strange, unnatural ways. Then, why was her head's abscondence of my space so infuriating to me? The answer to that conscious question came immediately, as I'd already had the answer to it for months. I detested this woman. No, I, I hadn't at first, of course, but now was time for me to sabotage what she considered to be a relationship. This was nothing new for me. I had long ago come to terms with my curse. That curse through the lens of others' eyes had been dubbed a number of things. Self-loathing. Misogyny. Sex addiction. Fear of abandonment. Fear of commitment. So many diagnoses from so many armchair psychologists throughout my life. The professional-grade therapist echoed some of these sentiments in soft science-laced drivel that was outdated as the leather furnishings and bound books around which they built their careers and their offices. My truth was far more interesting, at least to me. Vampirism comes in many forms. For untold years, tales of drinking blood or the sucking of the soul via sex have crossed cultures in decades to keep the myth of the Dracula-esque and the succubus-style vampires alive. Far less popular, though, gaining an attention from fantasy writers and folklorists everywhere, were energy vampires, creatures that fed off any number of energies. I don't know that I'd go on record saying that that designation energy vampire should be the one applied to me. I do know, however, that those first few months up to a year or two into getting to know someone new, I'm at my best. I do somehow feed on those initial conversations, those getting to know yous, those wild nights of passion without abandon, even the boring backstories that get in the way of some of those wild nights. The entire process made me able to need less sleep, less food, less caffeine, less everything. I run faster. I lift more weight easier. I think quicker and deeper. My creativity goes through the roof. During those initial times feeding, for lack of a better term, on a new person, I become a superior version of myself. Now, the people of the world are largely narcissistic beings, wallowing in their own insensitivity and toxicity, bordering on outright abusive to themselves and others. I have never been that type of person, creature, whatever. I actually have always received better energy from those positive first interactions. I have never been responsible for taking away someone else's happiness via any sort of vampiric doings. Still, my bad reputation among my longer lasting friends has been born of my need for romantic and sexual relationships to fill this hunger. Platonic energy fuels me, that is for sure. But the potency? is weak and thready compared to the strong pulse that comes from initiating a new romantic or sexual relationship. When the two can mix, that wine is finer than any other. Unfortunately, this means that I had never been able to have an extended relationship with someone, at least not one that had any real hope for longevity. In realizing I had this need, I had done 
as much research as one can when trying to wade through idiotic kooky tales for real, historically accurate instances of other creatures even similar to me. Be that as it may, I'd done the wading and found that others, such as me, had been able to tie together all three of those, platonic, romantic, and erotic love, and do so for an extended time. That meant that there was hope for me. The only problem is that that is the same hope that the normal people of the world spend billions each year to nurture allowing it to border on misdirected obsession bordering on utter fantasy. At my advancing age, I'd only met two, maybe three couples who mixed those three relationships and sustained them beyond the usual flash-in-the-pan peaks that defined most. So, I laid here, without a pillow. Realizing that I am going to have to go through the usual distancing, damning, and detangling that is required to convince someone you've convinced that you care about them that you actually do not. Such a strange thing, that. A refusal by another to accept your need to sever ties with them. Misplaced loyalty? Refusal to lose on an investment of the most finite resource living beings have. Time? Simple stubbornness? The answers for the why vary for every person. The sun was beginning to rise in earnest, driving away the gray dregs of night and moving the world into full daylight. She was beginning to shift this way and that, the light edging her toward wakefulness. I was nocturnal. She was diurnal. Just another reason this was doomed from the get-go. My nocturnal nature was from choice, unlike those damned bloodsuckers. Curious, though. I was beginning to realize that when I fed through conversation, sex, shared time, shared experiences, it was never as potent as time drew on. Yes, I was different from your average person. My wrinkles smoothed a little and my hair degrayed a bit when I fed, for example. But it was also become rather apparent that my feeding was necessary on the feelings being reciprocal. No reciprocal feeling? Nothing. Or just this side of it. I don't think that I am immortal. I don't think I'm even ageless. That's still all yet to be determined. I do know that I am different in some ways. That much has been revealed. And yet, I am, at the end of the day, held hostage by the same set of desires that every regular Jane or Joe carries with them, burdened their entire lives. We all seek that perfect balance. That person that can be one's everything. We're all off chasing dragons, hunting unicorns, seeking chimeras, Huh, says the vampire. Thank you for listening to Just Another, an original short story by me, Jared I. McGee. Well, that does it this week for prose. I do hope you enjoyed the two tales, and we'll be back in two weeks' time with two more. That's a lot of twos on a July morning. Until then, love those around you, tell them that you do, and embrace this life as it is, always, stranger than fiction. Thank you so much. 
for listening.